Thank you very much. <clears throat> um, I'm really honored and indeed happy to be speaking to you today. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to come to Greece. Um, and there's two things I'd like to get off my chest uh, before starting the actual presentation. Coming to Greece in these days, of course, uh, one cannot ignore the hard times that this nation is currently going through, but I am impressed by the determinants of this proud nation to overcome this crisis. And furthermore, it is my personal belief that Europe, not just as a continent, but as an idea, is built on solidarity. And with these two, determinants and solidarity, I'm sure there will be light at the end of the tunnel. The second thing is, talking about happiness in this crisis seems a bit, well, some people might say inappropriate. Some people might even say it's cynical. Well, I would say it isn't, actually. I would say now is the best time to talk about happiness. For each crisis is an opportunity to take stock, and it is often said that in Chinese, the word crisis has the two dimensions, meaning both danger but also opportunity. And it is this opportunity aspect that I'd like to emphasize with my talk, which will give you an overview of the latest international initiatives in order to measure happiness and to put it into practice in public policy making. Now, when you think about politics and public policy, the lawmaking process, ministers in dark suits, arguing and fighting over budgets. The word happiness is not the first thing that comes to mind, probably. Well, I would argue it should be. And I'd like to quote the author of the American Declaration of Independence, who put it quite beautifully. He said that the care of human life and happiness is the only legitimate object of good government. And in fact, around the world, there are a couple of interesting initiatives who are currently taking these words for granted and trying to put them into practice. And I'd like to talk about the opportunities that provides, the challenges we're facing, and also what future directions we could take and indeed should take. And then along the way, I will present you the latest initiatives such as the uh, UN World Happiness Report and also the OECD Better Life Index. <clears throat> but first of all, how do we know people are happy? How do you measure something as vague as happiness? Well, there are two ways, basically. One way is to collect a group of experts, put them in a room, and let them draw up a list of what they think is the good life. And they will probably come up with a list of a low unemployment rate, high education, um, lots of trust in society, high GDP. And that's all good, and that is a well-established way of measuring happiness. And um, there is also, and these are called, by the way, the objective measures of quality of life, but there's also another way, and I'd like to quote Aristotle, and there's probably no better place to quote Aristotle than here. And he explains this, this other way by saying, we must therefore survey what we have already said, talking about the good life, and you can imagine him talking to fellow philosopher friends about what the good life is, but he said we should bring it to the test of the facts of life, and if it harmonizes with the facts, we must accept it, but if it clashes with them, we must suppose it to be mere theory. In other words, we can also ask people directly, how happy are you? And then you can ask them a bunch of other questions, and you can then perform statistical analyses about the factors that drive happiness. And both approaches, objective and these subjective measures, are increasingly gaining importance across the world. And it is my prediction that the latter, the subjective ones, will actually become more important in the future. Because up until today, all too often, policymakers and advisors have equated being happy with having more stuff, more goods and services being traded in the economy. In other words, gross domestic product going up. But let me tell you why that is problematic. The latest summary of why GDP is problematic came from these people, from the Stieglitz Commission, which was presenting a report in 2009 highlighting that not only does GDP ignore inequality, in other words, if GDP goes up, we don't know who's getting richer. In fact, actually, median household income might go down, although GDP goes up, as was the case in the US. But also, 
GDP ignores sustainability. That is to say, we don't know if current growth comes at the expense of future generations, our kids, basically, or the natural environment. In fact, if there is an oil spill or a tornado or any natural disaster, it costs money and therefore GDP will go up, paradoxically. And also services outside the market, such as childcare, helping your neighbors, um, household work, it's all not captured by GDP, but in fact that uh, is, is an important factor in people's well-being. And why am I banging on about measurement? Why is this all important? Why am I emphasizing this so much? Well, the commission said, what we measure affects what we do. Therefore, if we don't measure the right thing, we won't do the right thing. And if you know, we don't have the right compass, we are ending up with the wrong decisions. And therefore, <clears throat> we should find a new compass. Also, if you look at data on people's subjective life satisfaction over the last, say, 50 years, and if you look at how income has gone up sharply in that period, you will find that actually the level of life satisfaction in the population has remained constant. You might have heard of the Easterlin paradox in that context. Another finding in happiness data is that if you look at countries by their GDP and you correlate that with the levels of happiness, you will find that at lower levels of GDP, growth makes quite a big difference, can make quite a big difference to happiness because basic needs have to be met. You need food in your belly, you need a roof over your head. But once basic needs are met, um, the importance of GDP, vice versa, other factors becomes less. And that is what economists call a decreasing marginal utility of income. So especially in richer nations, we're going to have to look at what drives well-being. And there are currently a number of stakeholders involved in finding new measures of national well-being or even international well-being, such as the OECD, who has championed this discourse right from the start, not only by supporting, significantly supporting the Stiglitz Commission, which I just mentioned, but also with more recent initiatives such as a House Life Compendium, and the Better Life Index, which I'm going to present in some more detail in a second. The European Commission is running a program also on GDP and beyond. And since 1990 already, <clears throat> excuse me, UNDP, the United Nations Development Program, has featured the Human Development Index, which puts development on a broader scale by broadening the indicators to not only to income, but also to health and education that are important. And more recently, the World Happiness Report. But not only on the global level, also on the national level, we have various governments and national roundtables involved here, such as in the UK um, or in Italy, Germany, Spain, and we've already seen some of the Bhutan, Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Commission. Civil society is also very active. The Canadian Wellbeing Index tries to capture well-being in a single number, such as GDP. And various statistical offices are currently having work programs such as in Australia about how to measure progress. But let me tell you about some of these cases in more detail so you get a better idea of what's going on at the moment in this development. Let's look at the national level first. And one country that is at the forefront here is the UK, and I have the pleasure of being in the advisory group of this initiative. Um, Therefore, uh, you will forgive me for highlighting some of the features of this uh, project, this exciting project. And there is a prime minister in the UK who is very keen to push this agenda forward, and he commissioned the Office for National Statistics to hold a national debate to come up with new measures. And in fact, 30,000 voices in Britain were heard to questions such as, what matters to you in life? And what should be reflected, in your opinion, in measures of national well-being? And um, following this intensive consultation process, measures of national well-being were now introduced. And at the core is the individual well-being, people's self-reported life satisfaction, which I'm going to show you in more detail in the next slide. This is complemented by the factors that we have identified in decades of research that drive well-being, such as health, the quality of relationships, especially trust, as we have heard from Her Excellency the Ambassador. Personal finance, people being able to make ends meet, education and skills, the activities we do and where we live, our neighborhoods, the quality of our environments, such as crime, etc. And this again is then complemented by contextual factors, such as governance, how good is the quality of the democracy, 
how good is the economy? Because GDP is still part of the picture, it just shouldn't be all. And of course, the natural environment is crucial. And there are two cross-cutting themes. One is equality, because we don't just want to see the average of a nation, we also want to see the distribution. And also sustainability, because as I said, it is important not to live today at the expense of our children tomorrow. And now I'd like to zoom in onto the first dimension, the individual well-being, which was at the core of the well-being measures. And there are four questions which were devised, which are currently and in the future will be asked to 200,000 Britons. So you can imagine people going with the integrated household survey, it's called knocking from door to door, asking people, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? Or nowadays, excuse me. Or how happy did you feel yesterday? Or how anxious did you feel yesterday? And finally, to what extent do you feel that the things you do in your life are worthwhile? And here we have the option to answer on a scale of zero to 10. And we have four different aspects of subjective well-being. So this gives you actually a very good idea of how subjective well-being can be measured in different dimensions. First of all, you have a cognitive evaluation, that is to say, you asked about life satisfaction, how people evaluate their life as a whole. Secondly, you have positive feeling, positive affect. How happy did you feel yesterday? Thirdly, how anxious did you feel yesterday? That is negative affect. And finally, the notion, going back to Aristotle, to lead a flourishing life, eudaimonia, to what extent do you feel the things you do in your life are worthwhile? So, so much for an initiative at the national level. Let's look at the international, at the global level, in fact. And in April this year, the United Nations launched the World Happiness Report. It was um, presented um, by and edited by the world-class economists John Halliwell of the University of British Columbia, Richard Layard of the London School of Economics, and Jeffrey Sachs of Columbia University. And at the launch, there was lots of uh, heads of states present, uh, a video message by Prince Charles, and the United Nations Secretary General Ban Ki-moon actually called he said at the launch, he called for a new economic paradigm, he said. We need one that recognizes the parity between the three pillars of sustainable development, social, economic, and environmental well-being. And he goes on to say, together they define gross global happiness. So quite some interesting words. But what is in the report? Well, the report contains an assessment of the state of the world's happiness, looking at the latest data we have on people's life satisfaction around the globe by asking those questions. And it also, secondly, summarizes the causes that we've identified in decades of research uh, of the causes of happiness, but also the causes of misery. Um, finally, there are also policy implications, because we don't just want to describe things, we'd also like to think about, well, what's the point? What should we make differently in the future if happiness was to be the central outcome of interest? And also, there are three case studies presented in more detail, one of them being the UK, which I've already shown you, one of them being Bhutan, about which we've heard this morning, and the OECD, which you will hear about in a second. Now, let's look at the report in some more detail. What is uh, the state of world's happiness? What is actually in there? And depending on what question you ask, and here I pick the question, uh, how satisfied are you with your life as a whole these days? Denmark is second, with apologies to the ambassador uh, in this ranking at least, and Costa Rica is the happiest place, but Denmark's still the happiest in Europe, so that takes some consolation perhaps. Um, and uh, you will find that there are surveys such as the Gallup World Poll, the World Value Survey asking such questions, and the answers range on, from 0 to 10, uh, roughly with Costa Rica on top at 8.5 out of 10, and Tanzania at the bottom with 2.5. Greece, you may be interested in uh, learning, is out of 129 countries in 39th place with an average of 6.8. So that's describing the state of the world happiness, if you like, according to the World Happiness Report. But what are the main recommendations? How can we all become like Costa Rica or like Denmark, basically? Well, the report argues basically four key recommendations which I'd like to highlight. First of all, do not pursue GDP growth at all costs. In other words, GDP is important, but it shouldn't be pursued to the point where economic stability is imperiled. Community cohesion is destroyed. 
inequality grows and the weak lose their dignity, ethical standards are sacrificed and the environment is put at risk. So in other words, we have a trade-off here always, trying to push GDP because it is an important thing, especially for debt reduction and jobs, but there are trade-offs and if you take well-being data seriously, you have to think about these other factors which I've just mentioned in at least equal measure. Secondly, the data on life satisfaction show that unemployment is always a very tough factor in terms of reducing well-being. Unemployment, in fact, significantly lowers life satisfaction beyond the monetary loss. So even if we control for income, as statisticians say, you still have a significant loss of well-being. And therefore, governments should think about various measures. And the, the authors go actually as far as saying a bad job is often better than no job. Therefore, any, anything that will people get back into work should be thought about by government, such as retraining, job matching, public employment, low-wage subsidies, education support in order to raise long-term skills, and job sharing. And fourth, the authors acknowledge that in most advanced countries, only a quarter of mentally ill people are in treatment, and of course even fewer in developing countries. And the authors conclude that to improve access to modern evidence-based psychological therapies could be a way out here, such as, for instance, cognitive behavioral therapy, to get more of those who need it um, sorted out. <clears throat> that was the global level. Now let's zoom in at sort of the rich nations on this planet, the OECD um, Better, your Better Life Index, actually. It's called Your Better Life Index for a reason, which I'm going to present to you in a second. It ranks mainly the OECD countries plus a few others uh, according to 11 dimensions which the OECD has deemed important and to make up the good life. It was launched in 2011. And these 11 dimensions are housing, income, jobs, community, education, the environment, civic engagement, health, life satisfaction, safety, and a good work-life balance. Now, example indicators for the environment could be air pollution, water quality, or for health, you could look at life expectancy of people across nations and the self-reported feeling, how healthy do you feel or how healthy do you think you are. So you have a nice mixture in the index of objective and subjective measures of quality of life. And if you look at the ranking, you will find that Australia actually comes on top, followed by Norway and the US. And Greece is more towards the bottom of the pile, but as I said, this is all only looking at the 36 uh, rich economies, so therefore um, it is still a good position overall. And this also I should say and emphasize, and I cannot emphasize actually strongly enough, this is only the ranking when equal weights are used. In other words, this is the ranking when all these factors which I've just read out are placed, are put on equal level. And the innovation, however, of the Better Life Index, and this is why it's called your Better Life Index, is that every internet user can go online on their website and change the weighting and say, well, actually, for me, housing is much more important than income, or I place more emphasis on work-life balance than on the environment. So everybody can alter the weights, and therefore the, the aim of the Better Life Index can be reached, which is to involve citizens in this debate, which is often very much led by statisticians and policymakers. And in fact, this is uh, tapping into a big problem, because when you devise quality of life, a single quality of life index, when you try to summarize all these things in one single measure, excuse me, you will have the problem of having to aggregate and then weight all the different units of analysis into one single figure, such as the unemployment rate comes in percentage, but life years come in years. And how, do you, how many life years are 1% unemployment rate worth? And how many years of education is $1,000 more in your pocket worth? So you have to make all these kinds of judgments. And with the OECD Better Life Index, everybody can make these judgments uh, themselves. So um, I would encourage you to go to the interactive website, it's a great tool, and play around with the data a little. <clears throat> in fact, uh, my colleague Jan Delay and I recently published a paper where we assessed a couple of new indices of quality of life 
uh, and we try to see how do they perform in a happiness test. In other words, how well do they predict the subjective levels of well-being in countries uh, compared to uh, GNI or GDP. There's a slight difference in the calculation, but it shouldn't bother you at this stage. Um, and it turns out that the Better Life Index is actually the only one of the six we tested which outperforms uh, GNI. So therefore, um, yeah, well done, OECD. Finally, I would like to look into the future with you. Now that we've seen how well-being can be measured, what different initiatives are there, uh, and actually how we've seen that they're doing a pretty good job, actually, I would say, what's the point of all this? You know, what are we where are we going to go from here if we figured out how to measure happiness, how to measure well-being correctly, say, in a couple of years? What happens then? We move on to the next point on the agenda and, uh, and carry on as before? Well, let me um, show you two ways uh, in which that could be prevented because these indices and this data that measure what matter can very often be overlooked in the chaotic process of, of lawmaking. Um, and you, know, you, you might be familiar describing the opportunistic and chaotic process of how uh, policies come into place. Uh, John Godfrey Sachs uh, said quite nicely, I think, laws are like sausages. It is better not to see them being made. And, and therefore, how can we get some systematic use of well-being data into the chaotic process of making policies and making laws? Uh, and there are two approaches which I think are worth highlighting at this stage. One is from Bhutan, and there they have developed a gross national happiness policy screening tool, which allows policymakers to assess a policy according to their effect on different levels of quality of life that they have deemed important. For instance, you can assess a policy whether it will increase stress in the population or what will be the effect on culture, what about material well-being and the environment. And then you can come up with a ranking score in the end. Of course, there are lots of challenges with that. For instance, you know, any policy will create a winner and a loser, winners and losers. You know, there's no such one policy which will make everybody equally happy. And so you have to incorporate the distributional aspect and also you have to figure out who is going to make this judgment because that's obviously a very powerful judgment and how do you make it in an objective way is a challenge. And also there can be trade-offs. So if one policy improves uh, material well-being, it might also increase stress. So how do you deal with the, with the trade-offs between the two? But what, what, what I'd like to take you, uh, you to take away from this and what I deeply believe is that this is the right way forward uh, to think about how well-being findings and how well-being data can be systematically included in the process of creating new policies and how to get policymakers think about uh, these initiatives and these data when they design uh, new policies. And my last example will be uh, from the UK again, where we have uh, what's called a green book. Um, and this green book is published by the Treasury, and it um, basically provides guidance for decision makers on the evaluation and appraisal of policy. And once we have sufficient data on well-being and we've figured out the right way of using them, we will be able, and they say subjective well-being measurement will be important, uh, in ensuring that the full range of impacts of proposed policies are considered, meaning that uh, we will be able to perform new cost-benefit analyses from these data. So we'll one day be able to test out new policies uh, and measure their well-being impact in certain vanguard communities before you roll them out uh, on, a national uh, on a national scale. Uh, and that will then allow you to allocate scarce public resources according to the actual well-being impact uh, that a policy uh, will have and may have had in a vanguard community. Now, as you can see, this is all still, some of it is still in the future, some of it is already happening. So what I'd like to emphasize at the end is that we are still at the beginning of a journey, but it is an exciting one, so do stay tuned. And hopefully at the end of it, we will have reached a state where this is no longer true. A man saying to another man, uh, well, you know, pursuit of happiness is all very well, but Congress or Parliament, if you like, keeps passing laws to make it run faster. And with that, I thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions, feel free to ask. I apologize for not speaking Greek. President Jefferson, uh, 
let's say, at the beginning, was all okay, but uh, then, when we see a dollar, we can read, in God we trust. So, later on, later on and nowadays, they think most of the time to have economical results. And in order to pursue that results, the adrenaline is going higher and higher and higher in order to hunt in something better. And sometimes we lose everyday happiness. Is it is a factor that we must search everyday happiness in everything. I mean, we lost the communication. And uh, in countries like yours, yes, uh, I see that uh, you are very happy people in Denmark. But you don't have uh, so much family bonds. I, I heard that uh, when uh, the kids come to their youth, they must pay for their room in order to stay with their parents. Here in Greece, yes, we have the crisis, but we don't have sacrificed, not yet, the family bonds. And uh, I think we must also see that perspective. And uh, that, that, that's my question. Uh, the family bonds and uh, the traditional com communication is not a factor that we must search in order to obtain the happiness? That's my question. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. I firmly agree with your assessment. And in fact, this is something I would like to uh, be the key message, if you like, uh, of, of my talk, is that there are lots of factors which tend to be overlooked when we assess an economy just by, or a country just by how its, how its economy is going, such as family bonds. And Greece is, of course, one of the countries in Europe where family bonds are the strongest and most supportive. And you can see that also in the OECD Better Life Index, Greece is doing very well, for example, on safety measures, on work-life balance, and these things are really important to well-being. So this is one of the key messages of the well-being data to you know, on the way to modernization, and also, especially as if you look at uh, developing countries, if you look at countries who are sort of chasing up to the Western ideal and trying to become like us, you know, the message to them from this data would be not to sacrifice things like community cohesion on the way and the natural environment, because they might come to regret it at some point, because once it's destroyed, it's very hard to build up again. Well, when uh, Prince Charles or Ban Ki-moon are enthusiastic about uh, an initiative of the UN or the, of the OECD. Certainly, it's an interesting initiative, but are you aware, are we aware of how well received and how far integrated in public policy have these initiatives been? Have they been considered useful, in fact? Mm, thank you very much. Yeah, that's, that's a key question. And my answer would be, they are noticed, but by far not enough yet. And this is why I keep advocating these approaches and keep banging on about them. And so do the economists I mentioned, John Helliwell, Richard Layard, Jeffrey Sachs. They are advocating this approach to policy making. And of course, every approach to policy making is, is, in, is, is sort of in competition with other ones. You know, there are people close to governments, uh, hard-nosed economists who say, you know, this well-being stuff uh, should probably not be, not be the, the priority. And therefore, uh, it is important, I think, to show avant-garde approaches such as the one in Bhutan or the one in the UK Green Book and to actually see how this can make a difference to the policy-making process. But at the moment, there's not enough of that yet, and it is always in competition with other opinions. But I think we have a fair chance of, uh, of getting, getting ahead quite a bit in the future. Well, uh, this is all very interesting. I wanted to ask you, what about politics and political ideological uh, factors that may come into these discussions? You know, do you get, this is in a way a follow-up question, I mean, after the question that was asked, uh, to what extent do you get reactions from particular politically charged or um, informed uh, policy makers? Because in different countries, there are different ideologies and, and these factors count in different ways. 
I mean, the factors that are taken into account in the happiness measurements. And, and somebody who may have a normative agenda or an ideological agenda may object to some of these. Now, watching Bhutan, I mean, somebody might come and say, well, this is all very well, but, but what do they mean by democracy there? I mean, there is the leader, the king, mm -hmm. the paternalistic <coughs> attitude, you know, they decide what is good for the people. I mean, so mm -hmm. to what extent do you try to remain neutral and to what extent, you know, uh, you, you just cut across these ideologies and what kinds of reactions do you get from politically uh, mm -hmm. informed uh, mm -hmm. you know, policy makers? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is a very interesting phenomenon, actually, that currently in politics this approach is being picked up, but it's being picked up by different parties in different countries, for instance. Um, you've got uh, David Cameron, who uh, is, a, is a conservative, is very much in favor of this agenda. Um, in, in Germany, you have a co coalition of um, the, the Social Democrats and the Green Party who uh, put in place a, or put in, put in place the uh, initiative to have uh, a commission to look at these factors. Um, and I wrote a paper in which I urged politicians and especially party politicians to think about uh, what would be the indicators that you deem important and can you make clear to voters what your ideology actually stands for by pointing to clear indicators and I think that approach would have a number of benefits for instance voters would again be able to see what are the distinguishable features of a social democratic party versus a Christian democratic party what are the indicators that you favor to put some more transparency into just a bunch of you know men and women in dark suits who uh, don't really want to be attached to a, a precise key message. Um, so that is certainly an issue that will be more important in the future as politics tries to, tries to pick up this approach and we have to make sure that it doesn't get trampled over by party political interests.